and welcome to this online Night at the Museum event organised by Highgate School Museum and Archive. My name is David Smith and after many years of teaching physics at Highgate, I now work part-time in the Archive, where one of my roles is to organise occasional evening lectures for parents, pupils, alumni and friends. Before the pandemic, the talks took place in the School Museum. In this aerial photograph of Highgate looking west, you can see the senior school site with the museum just across the road. In this more recent photograph looking southeast, the senior school site and the museum are again highlighted. The school museum is the large white building on the left of this photograph. In a former life, it used to be a nonconformist chapel. It now houses some exhibits from our collection telling the 457 year history of Highgate School, its relationship with Highgate Village, and how it endured two world wars. Exhibits include a royal charter of Queen Elizabeth I, World War I letters, and photographs of the school's evacuation to Westwood Ho in World War II. Please do get in touch if you'd like a tour. Sadly, we are not there this evening, but one advantage of Zoom is that we can involve a larger and more geographically diverse audience. And in fact, our speaker, Elaine Woodbridge, is in Reading, while I am in North Wales near Carnarvon, both of us quite a long way from North London. Elaine studied archaeology, anthropology and sociology at the University of Cape Town. She has been fascinated with mid-century slide photographs since she began collecting them more than 20 years ago in South Africa. In her journey with old slides, she has digitised and creatively edited them, shared them on social media, made art and given public talks about them. While completing a master's degree in archives and record management at the University of Dundee, she has been a volunteer archivist at Highgate School, working on the school's photographic slide collection and other projects. She has recently started a new job at the Wiener Holocaust Library in Bloomsbury. Thank you so much, Elaine, for having offered to speak to us this evening. We are very much looking forward to learning about vernacular photography. David, and hello to everybody who's joined the talk. Um, thanks for coming tonight. Um, I'm very pleased, very excited, in fact, to be talking to you about snapshot photography. Um, as David says, it's a subject that I've been fascinated with and involved with for over 20 years now, initially as an amateur collector. And now I've been able to explore that through my role as an archivist at Highgate School and now the Vena Holocaust Library. So it's a subject that I absolutely love talking about. Um, I'm an extremely visual person. I love diving into the images and looking at that world of mid-century 1950s, 60s and 70s, um, and we'll be doing a lot of looking at some very curious and beautiful images, um, snapshot photographs during this talk. So there's a lot of image sharing um, and we won't be an analysing them too much, hopefully just enjoying them and learning a little bit about what snapshot photography is and then also about Highgate School's collection. So let's start by thinking about what snapshot photography is. Um, when this talk was first advertised, I used a different term, vernacular photography, and we had a little discussion at the school and we thought, well, you know, snapshot photography, snapshot is probably a term that more people are familiar with. And so we ended up going with that title for the talk. But in fact, there are a bunch of interchangeable terms for snapshot photography. They can be used in, interchangeably. Um, they've arisen at different points in history. And um, here are some of them on the slide. So um, we'll discuss them a little bit now and then um, as we go through the talk. But basically, I've just put up a, an archivist's definition of snapshot photography here. There are obviously loads of other um, longer, more complex image um, definitions that try to encompass more of what it's about. And it's a very wide ranging and um, changing um, aspect of photography. So it's quite hard to define, but According to the Dictionary of Archives Terminology, a snapshot is a photograph often made quickly with little or no attention to formal composition. 
and just there you go that's a very simple um definition so here are here's that definition that i was talking about and here are some of the terms that are used for snapshot photography um instantaneous photography is quite obvious that refers to the click of the camera the instant picture and it also implies the instant development of pictures as well um it's a term that's not used as much as perhaps some of the others, but I think it does say quite a lot about how the the um, how the pictures are taken. Um, domestic photography is also used. That refers to the context and the the content of a lot of the pictures. Amateur photography refers to the photographer. Um, and an amateur says, well, you're not a pro, but it also says maybe you're aspiring to be a good photographer. Family photography is used quite a lot um, and that refers to the subject of a lot of snapshot photographs. They're taken in the home, they're taken of family members and also friends. Um, vernacular photography is the slightly more proper term for photographs taken by ordinary people of everyday subjects. And then some other terms like community and grassroots photography are used for the same thing, and they started to be used in around the 1980s, um, together with certain photography movements. Um, so what are the qualities of snapshot photography? They have to do with the content, the skill and choices of the photographer, the informal nature of the photography, but a sense of belonging um, by the photographer to the world being photographed. Um, it kind of applies to the age of the material because it's generally used for mid-century photographs, although it technically can be used for other periods of time as well. And there's a sort of general aesthetic effect that is snapshot photography, and we'll be going to, into that in more detail during the talk. So basically, it's in inexpertly captured photographs where there may be um, some blurry movement, cut off elements, off center composition, the picture could be out of focus, the lighting could be poor, especially indoors or um, nighttime photography. Um, Generally, it's family events, holidays, children's games and sport, photographs taken in familiar and private and domestic spaces, showing the kinds of activities that happen inside people's homes. It could be cars. People take pictures of cars on the day, on the day that they get a new car or otherwise while they're out on the street. And those old car photographs are quite fascinating to people today who collect snapshot photographs. Also, because they're often travel photographs, we have the means of transport, leisure and travel appearing in the pictures, um, all sorts of sightseeing and tourism, hotel rooms and fun fairs, um, and so on. And then because a lot of the photographs are now getting quite old, they might have been picked up in markets, they might have been stored in a garage, there's an element of um, aging to the pictures and that's another aesthetic aspect that I will be talking about later on but mold and damage noise grainy film scratches and things like that are also part of the snapshot aesthetic um, and we'll hopefully be exploring what this means in a school setting obviously in a school we're not necessarily in a private space um, we're not necessarily taking pictures of the same things, but a lot of these qualities do apply to snapshot photographs taken by amateur photograph photographers in a school setting. So just to make the point, here is a snapshot photograph from Highgate School and a professional photograph from Highgate School taken by a professional photographer. And um, I don't know if you can see or feel some of the, the differences between these. So on the left hand side, there's the sense that the person is really familiar in that environment, they're probably sitting on the table while they're taking that picture. Um, the pupils don't seem particularly disturbed or uncomfortable with their presence. Um, there's no, there's been no tidying up of the mess. Um, 
one of the pupils has got the apron sort of hanging off untidily. And so there's that sense of sort of gritty familiarity in the photograph on the left compared to the one on the right, which has been clearly tidied up and posed and so on. So hopefully this um, demonstrates some of the qualities of snapshot photography and perhaps why they are so lovely. Um, now, there are lots of different ways to think about snapshot photography, and sometimes all of this gets merged together, and it's nice to separate it out so that you know what you're thinking about at different times. So snapshot photography has got certain film and processing technology um, that was used for mass photography. Um, we won't be covering that in the talk, but if anybody has any questions about it, I might be able to answer them. Um, they're the products of snapshot photography and those are the actual prints and slides and also there are the tools used for making those products. Um, separately to that there is human behavior and culture. Now human behavior and culture need not necessarily result in any products because I know of or you may have heard of photo collections where somebody finds a stash of undeveloped film. So in a sense then the products have never been made but the behavior still happened and um, that person was still taking a camera out, taking photographs and participating in society and in culture through photography without actually even producing any products. So it's quite interesting when you separate those two things in your mind because they're not the same. Um, then we can look at the art and aesthetics, and we will be looking at that in the talk. We can also look at archiving and preservation and how to deal with your family collection. So we'll be looking at that as well. Then we need to consider restrictions around use like copyright, data protection, and so on. So these are this is kind of like a little bit of a mind map of the, some of the things that I will be covering in the talk. Um, and if there's anything that interests you there, we may be able to return to them in the questions. So here is my um, kind of summary of the history of photography and the two, and to show you where the two collections that um, feature in this talk, where they fit in. So photography was invent is an invention from the 1800s, but mass photography really only got going in the 1900s probably around the 1920s and 30s into the 40s with really um, the golden age of snapshot photography and mass photography spanning the middle of the last century. Um, mass photography did start out with black and white photography um, and then Color photography was developed with the golden age of slide photography sort of spanning the 1950s and 60s into the 70s. Um, now, it stretched through the 90s, maybe up to the 2000s, but it pretty much tailed off into print photography. And of course, now we have the age of digital photography. So <laughs> that's obviously quite a complex history in the history of photography, but I wanted to give you kind of the broad sweep of it so that I could make a couple of points. And the one is that Highgate's collection starts in about the mid mid 60s and goes through to the late mid to late 1980s. And my collection from South Africa starts in the mid 50s and goes through to about the early 1970s. So that's just to let you know where those fit in within this broad sweep of the history of photography. Also, it's nice to look at this because what you can see is this period of time from the beginnings of mass photography in the 1930s. It spans a couple of lifetimes and the result of this, or it sort of helps to make sense of why large amounts of orphaned and discarded 35 millimeter slides, which by the way is the focus of the talk, um, have been sort of dumped back out from, from the family context and into the world through um, people um, passing on, people moving home, people 
just getting old and getting rid of their slide collections and huge amounts of material from these two generations from the night but the 1920s and 30s through to the 2000s have become available now and that's how i've managed to put my collection together and i suspect it's how some of the slides have ended up being donated to highgate school and could be donated in the future so um that gives you just a little bit of perspective a broad sweep of the history of photography um, which I don't claim to be any sort of expert on, but it does help me to see this so that I know where the collections that I'm dealing with fit in, in terms of this history. And uh, we're going to start with my South African collection now, just having a look at some examples of snapshot photography. Um, when I say it's a South African collection, what I mean is that I collected these whilst I was living in South Africa from other South Africans. It doesn't necessarily mean that the pictures will were all taken in South Africa. A lot of them, because they travel photographs, were taken all over the world. So we'll see all sorts of places in them. Um, and hopefully they'll demonstrate to you some of the qualities of snapshot photography. So I'm just to get your eye into looking at images. I've just started with a, a sort of odd one and snapshot photography photography is full of all these sorts of odd images you've got somebody slightly airborne you've got people cut off on the side it's a weird composition you don't know where this is but it's got that kind of grit that makes it interesting uh, this is one from the 1950s in the usa um, it's a street scene it's crowds it's not the best composition you've got somebody with a weird face cut off on the on the right hand side it's that kind of mid-century world that's really, really interesting and gritty in this photograph. Um, a street scene. I absolutely love the car with the crushed, uh, dented in front there. Some of these street scenes can be really, really serene looking and interesting to compare to today's streets that are full of advertising. Um, it's really interesting to see what streets looked like in the mid-century period. With streets comes um, crowds and people and street photography. Um, this is a, a really amazing Im image. Um, it's got lots of gritty detail in it. It's got the texture of clothing. I love the shoes. I love the suitcase. There's lots to look at there. This one, um, I like the movement of the water and the way one man has been caught, perhaps lighting a cigarette. There's somebody walking and, and a group of men standing together. You've got all the movement of the water. It's a very odd composition, but it somehow works extremely well. This one is um, a South American um, tourist on in London on holiday and um, this is from a collection that's really interesting to see how um, this group of friends kind of dressed and remade themselves for their, their trip in Europe. Um, here's more travel in Europe. Um, what I like about this is the clothing of the of the era and, and also it's so different to today where everybody would probably be on their mobile phones. Um, and here everybody's standing and listening to a talk probably. Um, that sort of domestic fishing scene um, and two friends called chatting. This one, an odd composition with a child running in the background. Um, we've got passenger boat travel, fun fair. And somebody caught sleeping on the train. I love that gritty area on the right hand side. Um, and this is a lovely sort of snapshot of people traveling and on the move. And here we have um, a road trip. This one is taken in South Africa suitcases on top of the car, 
just held on by a couple of ropes. Um, children playing in the outdoors in South Africa. And wedding photographs are quite common as well. I really love um, the bride's little crown on the right. And I also like the way the picture's being composed on the left very carefully, trying to incorporate so many elements, including probably, I think, the groom in a photo frame on the dresser there on the left. This is probably my ultimate favorite and best example of a snapshot photograph but all the weird cut off elements and you've just got that moment in time captured it's a domestic scene it's private in a sense although here we have it on the internet um and it's just got all that movement in it and i think it's just an amazing compelling photograph i love looking at it this is a Sunday roast in the outdoors in South Africa. Um, so capturing those sort of traditions in the way they done quite formally in the mid century period. A couple of uh, university student friends. This is actually in near the University of Cape Town and um, they're just there in the Fainbos, which is the, um, the floral kingdom in the Cape, um, taking photos of each other. This is um, Spotty Dog, um, a bit of vernacular architecture in a vernacular photograph. Um, this building is famous to, to a lot of people in South Africa and my found photographs of um, Spotty Dog get a lot of attention. This couple, um, I really like them. They've taken some amazing photographs. I love their collection. And the, these sort of quiet sitting pictures um, just capture the atmosphere of their home life and I think are really beautiful. And this is the same man and his child and the child at home sleeping on the couch with a comic book. Another family, um, this is such a beautiful image, the dog, the, uh, the doormat, the stone wall. Um, the pram, all of it is just really stunning. And this kind of domestic scene, um, you know, it's got very poor lighting, but it's just, it's absolutely captured that's right in the heart of the, of the family home. Outdoor games, um, all the movement in this picture, all the fun and the, the kind of family feeling is just amazing. Um, and, you know, this is a beautiful example of what snapshot photography can capture in that frozen moment. Um, a couple more frozen moments. <laughs> and this, I absolutely love how that woman is behind the tree. Might not have been a good composition, but I think it's just absolutely fantastic. And then these means of transport, that's a, a Johannesburg street scene at night, um, a bus in Cape Town. Um, and this tea party, another domestic scene that I absolutely love. And ending off with this picture of a car. And it's really quite a serene picture. It doesn't quite have the snapshottiness of some others, but um, I think that the sort of banal nature of some of some snapshot photographs is 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 quite beautiful as well. So now that I've shown you all of those, I just wanted to say that they are all edited and enhanced from the originals. So I do work with, and I do like to share edited and enhanced photographs. And you know, I've tried to summarize here for you, if, if anybody's interested, my process. So after receiving um, a photograph, either as a, a donation or a found photograph, or I've been paid to do it, I'll do an initial assessment and think about the aesthetic aspects of the picture. I may, I may need to clean up the slide a little bit if necessary. And then I'll go to digitizing it. Um, I'll use a high resolution flatbed, flatbed photographic scanner for slides. And um, a lot of um, software for scanning nowadays offers automatic adjustment adjustments. I don't recommend doing that. I recommend um, 
scanning as it is at the highest possible resolution and using a photographic scanner, not a document scanner. Um, then that's how I would capture my original digital version and that gets saved away and that isn't touched again. Then I go to um, my first level now. I don't know why. Oh, wait, no, wait. Oh, okay, we're going, <laughs> going from the bottom up. Okay, so the next step for me, once I've got um, my original saved away and then I start to work on a digital copy of that original scan, the first thing I do is to um, clean up um, noise and artifacts from the JPEG creation. Um, and I use a particular set of filters called Topaz Labs filters. And um, when you zoom in really, really close, almost to the pixel level, you can see all sorts of noise, artifacts, banding, and, and things that um, will ruin any subsequent editing work. So that must be smoothed out and cleaned before any work can be done digitally on the on the copy. So um, that's the first step. I'll also probably um, crop and straighten and repair the corners because slides have got these sort of rounded corners and they often need to be filled in so that um, you end up with a, um, a rectangular photograph with, with neat corners. Um, the next step in my process is to find um, the black and white points of the photograph and to um, work on the on the levels and curves and that, that might I don't know who's <laughs> listening to this or that might sound quite technical or you might know what I'm talking about but it's um, about getting the balance in the in the picture right between the dark and the light areas um, possibly fixing highlights and shadows and doing some color correction because old slides and old photos have usually had had um, just through aging distortions in color. So that needs to be corrected. And, and that's the sort of basic level. Then I might go to do some more color work to really enhance it, um, to do some other repairs and edits and to um, remove damage. Although I will be getting coming back to damage later in the talk because damage can also be quite lovely. Um, but it's quite a light touch. And what I'm trying to do is to improve the image so that it becomes more accessible. Um, at the bottom, what I've said at the bottom of the slide is I try to enhance the images to make the image accessible and the content to come to life, but never so that the edits get in the way so that people are saying, oh, I don't like the way that's been, that's been too filtered. Um, that's not what I want. I don't want anybody to notice the work that I've done. I just want it to become um, more accessible, easier to digest and, and more lovely to look at. Um, I might go to um, a next level of enhancement, depending on what um, the person I'm working for wants or what is suggested to me by the image itself. Um, but all of these um, different uh, stages of work are saved in separate copies so that it's easy to always roll back. And in Photoshop, I use layers so that it's easy to roll back to the original at any stage. After all that's done, it's, I go on to sharing, showing and publishing if it's acceptable and legal to do so. And, and that's really my kind of technical process in the background with images. So everything I've just shown you from my own collection has been edited in this way and everything that I will be showing you in the rest of this talk from the Highgate Schools collection is also the edited version. So Highgate has the original, it has the original untouched scan, and then it has the edited version that I've worked on. And the edited version is what you'll be seeing tonight. All right, so Highgate's collection, um, I was absolutely delighted to be given the opportunity to work with it. Um, and when I started working with Highgate School as a volunteer, they wanted me to work on um, some other archive projects, but 
um, I said to them that I was particularly interested in snapshot photographs and I found out that the school had a slide collection that hadn't been um, processed or edited in any way and it hadn't been catalogued yet so um, I was really delighted to be able to help them with that. Um, the collection has um, several hundred um, 35 millimeter slides in it they're from the 1960s through to the 1980s as I was saying earlier um, they are either Kodachrome slides, the 60s are all Kodachrome slides, but so are some of the 1980 slides. Otherwise, the 70s and 80s slides are Agfa color um, film. Um, all of this collection was, in a sense, found in the archive already when the first official archivist at the school was appointed in 2013. So um, as a result, we don't know who took the pictures or who donated them. Um, we think because of the way they're taken and the places they're taken in and the content that they're probably taken by staff at the school and school teachers, but and it's difficult to, to get a sense for how many teachers that might have been, but we think that there might have been quite a few different people taking photographs and and leaving them for the archive. We just don't know. And um, if if you're listening to this talk and you might know who took some of the pictures, if you have any idea or any suggestions for us, or you actually know who, who those people were, we would love to hear from you because it's really important that we have that information um, that we understand where the, the photos originated and who took them and why. Um, so this collection has now all been digi digitized um, and catalogued. And that was the volunteer project that I did for, for Highgate School. And um, so now that means they're all findable and usable by the archivists and if appropriate by um, the searchers who want to access the collection. I talked to um, Julia Hudson, the, the school archivist, and she said that um, the value of this collection to the school is that it adds to their knowledge and their picture of the school in previous decades, um, that it's useful for the estates department, which has questions quite often about the history of buildings. Um, there are lots of pictures of buildings that have been captured in this collection of slides, um, and that it's valuable for engaging alumni of the school. Um, it helps to bring back memories, it inspires writing, and it encourages more people to bring their photographs to the school and donate them to the school. And then, of course, it also helps to tell the history of the school to current pupils and the current community of the school, including parents. Right, so let's have a look at some snapshots from Highgate School's collection. First, as mentioned, we have some pictures of buildings. Um, this is this is the side of the chapel, and I'm not quite sure what all is in that image, but I I love the the huge and solid sense of that um, building. It's a snapshot because it's got moving cars in it. It hasn't been well composed in a sense. It's it's grainy and blurry, um, but I love those lights at the back of the cars. Um, it's it's just beautiful, and it's it's the it's the school buildings, the school environment. Now, this is not a building that's changed a lot over time, but I think it's nice to see that solid building um, in another decade as evidenced by the cars. Here we have a derelict swimming pool at, at the school. And I'm not quite sure what's happened to the site, but obviously it was in a state of transition or decay at the time that this picture was taken. Um, the pool on the right is not the same one, but I believe that building may also have had some changes to it. Um, I don't necessarily know the details of exactly what's happened but, um, to these buildings, but these are all taken 
um, in the 1980s and they have preserved what those places looked like at that time. Here we've got um, some cars parked outside the school and we've got the main entrance to the big school there. And right above that is a, um, a crest, which I believe was taken down when some um, renovations were being done at, at some point and it disappeared. So that is a piece of the school that the school no longer has. And here we have it captured in some photographs. Um, we don't know where that is now. Um, we've also got lots of pictures of construction sites. Um, so this was, I think, the sports building and the map at the back is another building. There's a plan for another building. Now, that's the sort of document that you might have in the archive, but what you won't necessarily have is um, a day-by-day -day, um, photo story of how that was built and how it how that um, field, which was green grass, basically turned into a new building. And that's been captured in, in the snapshot photographs that the school has. So that's really valuable to be able to see and interesting for the, for the estates department. Next, we come to some interior spaces. And I absolutely love some of these. So these are some of the most beautiful pictures in the collection, really. Um, um, really serene, um, familiar feeling and welcoming um, interior spaces. Um, this is one that won't have changed a lot. It's the chapel. Um, this was something I, um, that was virtually completely dark in the snapshot, um, but I managed to edit it and, and to bring out some, uh, some color and information from that picture. Um, and then there are just these lovely gritty pictures. This is a print is the print room in I think I think those are the late sixties in the print room. Um, lots of detail in here, um, and it's got all that lovely gritty graininess of a snapshot photograph. This is the um, the photo dark room, also from the same era, and this is the music room. And I love the light coming from the window and the mysterious dark painting and the light reflected on the surface of the table. This is the library. Also, again, lovely light, um, just a lovely interior space. And I can imagine the teacher walking around maybe after school hours and um, just walking through all these different spaces of the school and capturing them for, for posterity. This is a lovely picture of the, I think this is, is Central Hall. I'm not quite sure of the, of the names of all of the spaces, but what's lovely here, this is a 1980s picture, is the school bags. And then there's lots to look at there on that notice board. Um, that's just a picture of the life of the school right there and all those notices on the board. This is, um, a, an interior of the um, the dining room of one of the um, boarding houses. Um, like a lot of snapshot photographs, struggles with lighting inside at night. But I think with all of those reflections on wooden surfaces, I think this is, is such an atmospheric picture and um, uh, really lovely. Um, rehearsals for the school play. I don't know what the space looks like now, but that was captured in, I think, the 1980s. And um, Highgate School used to have a number of boarding houses, and this is such a rare thing to have captured. This is the interior of the boarding house with um, the furniture, the beds, where the people slept, and um, yeah, this is what it looked like. This no longer exists, and it's lovely to have. Um, another picture of a bedroom in boarding house showing the desk 
and the chair under the window. Then we've got a number of pictures of school life. Now the collection is full of pictures of school life. Um, inevitably, they show lots of people and that's what makes them amazing. But because of um, GDPR and personal data protection, we can't show these photographs um, close up and large. And in terms of the school's policy, they would be um, protected for 100 years from being available to the public. So what I've done is just put a whole bunch of them together on the next slide so that you can very, very briefly see before I click to the next slide what a large part of the collection, this wonderful collection, contains all these pictures of people in school life. So Highgate School has this and um, and highly values it and will be holding it for 100 years, at which time whoever is alive will be able to access it freely. Um, some other things I can show you are some surprising and illustrative details um, of those other decades um, that we have in the collection. So this is a behind the curtains on the stage, um, the band set up getting ready to perform at the school concert. And there's lots of interesting detail in that. Then um, also um, 1980s, we have some um, images of the kinds of computer equipment being used at um, very, very early computer um, era, digital era. Um, I'm sure some people may remember having these kind of, this kind of equipment around. It's it immediately communicates about being a different era. It technologically is so different to today. And then absolutely fascinating. I think there's that. I'm not sure if it's quite the same notice board as the as the other image um, a few back. But here's another notice board on the right. I love the fact that a teacher has gone around and captured what was on the notice board on a particular day. And, um, you know, it's like a, a day in the life of Highgate School um, and what happened to be on the notice board at the time. So that sort of detail is, is really lovely to have in the collection. We've also got these um, of masters um, marking some of the work. Um, and that's also um, lovely kind of detail. All in the analog on paper world. And this is one of my absolute favorites that I wanted to share with you. This is the War Games Club. And you can see um, on attached to the to the vertical sticks are little aeroplanes. And on the floor are with masking tape are um, front lines and things drawn and and this is the war war game what did i say war games club i don't i'm not quite sure what they were called but anyway this is this um is what what children used to do before they had computer games <laughs> and um this is them busy um um, playing with war strategy and, and maybe actual World War II battles, I don't know. But this is a fascinating image because of what it captures of another time. Not that long ago, actually. <laughs> All right. Now, with some of the school's slides, I did get a little bit creative. And that was because they really suggested to me that they could do with some creative treatment and this is one of them it has it's for it was you can see the original on on the bottom right and and um this was really sort of blown out white in the middle of of the picture there there really was hardly a face on the person in the middle um but with a bit of creative editing and um this sort of um brown sepia um treatment it manages to bring more details out and it sort of suits i think the um 
the dramatic setting, the drama and stage setting of this. And there are a few more over here. Um, I haven't got the originals there for you to see, but um, I had some fun with that. Naturally, the originals have been saved away separately, but um, these um, creatively edited, and in fact, all of the images have been edited um, with the idea in mind that they these versions can be um, immediately accessed and used for, for publishing within the school, in displays in the museum. Um, and so they, there's a, a nicely edited, immediately accessible copy that the school can use for publications if it wants to. And with all that creativity, we now come to the next section of the talk. Um, on the art world and snapshot photographs. Now I'm going to gallop through this quite quickly. Um, um, there's a, a very interesting relationship between snapshot photographs and the art world. And these are some of the things around um, in this diagram um, showing you what are the ways in which um, snapshots and the art world can work together. Influencing fine art photography, defining and valuing a snapshot aesthetic. Um, galleries and associations exhibiting snapshots in a formal art context. The later recognition of previously unknown photographers who are now understood as being artists in their own right. Um, the creativity of amateur collectors and found photo enthusiasts like myself. Um, and old and found photographs as an art, art making material, a physical and digital art making material. And then coming back to something I mentioned earlier, the aesthetics of aged material. And with all of this, art museums are collecting and acquiring um, snapshot photographs made by ordinary people. So let's have a look at some examples of this. Now, defining a snapshot aesthetic, we did right at the beginning. And I think some of the fascination and the conversations in the art world around um, the snapshot aesthetic have had to do with it being some sort of um, innocent state that a trained um, fine art photographer would really struggle to mimic because it's like the snapshots aesthetic can only be really be achieved by as a sort of an accident by an amateur and, and a sort of innocent in terms of formal fine art photography. And um, <laughs> I experimented with this a little bit. And this is a picture I took um, just by walking around in the airport and just randomly snapping my camera in all sorts of directions without looking through the viewfinder just to see what I would get and whether that could be a sort of a snapshot and well i captured this image and um i think that this does fulfill some of the snapshot aesthetic um and as an experiment it was quite interesting to do um here is a fine art photographer by the name of stephen shaw who in the 1970s when all of this interest in snapshot photography was starting um he's an amazing photographer who um it went into the kind of everyday spaces that um, snapshot and vernacular photography had brought to light in the art world. And he started photographing it, but from um, a professional fine art photographer's point of view. Although sometimes when you look at them, because he's deliberately imitating a snapshot aesthetic, it's quite hard to tell um, that it was taken by a a trained photographer. So his work is really interesting. I recommend going to have a look at it. It's got all that interest of um, a previous decade that has has gone and he's captured the surfaces of that. Um, and his some of his work is called American Surfaces. He's captured that in his work and he's been heavily, heavily influenced by this interest in the snapshot aesthetic. Galleries exhibiting snapshots. There have been multiple um, exhibitions. I, I, I'd have to say that the USA has led in this, but um, galleries, serious galleries, 
um, exhibiting and collecting snapshot photographs. And here's an example of an exhibition like that. So all of this has been happening, a lot of it with found photographs, a lot of it with photographs that have been um, sort of dumped out into the world that are no longer in their original family context. They've been picked up and found, and now they find themselves being exhibited in formal galleries. Here's an exhibition that I put on with some of mine, um, and this press photograph on the right hand side of somebody sort of really getting into some of the images. Um, I had two small exhibitions in 2013 in Cape Town. Um, this is a snapshot that I entered in and was selected for an, an online exhibition by Lens Scratch, which is another interesting um, photography organization to have a look at. Um, people eating, it's quite heavily edited, um, but it basically is a snapshot photograph that was selected for an exhibition on people eating for at around Thanksgiving time in the USA in 2014. Then uh, I don't know how many people have heard of Vivian Meyer. She um, is a photographer from New York who photographed New York in the 1950s. She was a nanny. She went around the streets of New York with children or on her own and she snapped photographs and she was brilliant. And in fact, I've just learned that there was an exhibition of her work in Milton Keynes. I forget the name of the gallery. Um, just just recently in the last few months, and it's the first time that Vivian Meyer's work has been exhibited in the UK. So she's an example of the, the fine art world changing its mind around um, photography, getting fascinated with the snapshot aesthetic and recognition coming to people like Vivian Meyer posthumously. Then um, snapshot photographs, physical prints have become a material for art making in, in the art world, um, from collage to um, all sorts of all sorts of very interesting work, a lot of it somehow involving stitching. And then one of my absolute favorite artists, I don't know how to pronounce this, Kensuke Koike, uh, is a Japanese artist who does um, dynamic physical moving things with um, cut um, portrait photographs and 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 other vernacular photo photographs. Um, his work is amazing. I recommend having a look at it if you're interested in um, seeing what can be done with physical photographs in a in a highly creative way. So art making. Um, and then there's an entire community of people who are amateur collectors who collect found photographs and share them on Instagram. So in blue there, you don't have to read all of this, um, are some of the names of these Instagram accounts. And I think it can be really, really interesting, even if you just pick up one or two of those names, to see um, the sort of flavor of what they're about. One of my favorites down at the bottom right is Dead Men I'm In Love With. And that person just shares images of um, men, interesting looking and <laughs> in, in curious sort of poses or circumstances with with curious expressions on their faces or whatever. Um, that's what they specialize in. But each of these accounts is collecting from amongst this sort of um, swirling um, body of photographs that have been released into the world as people have passed on and got rid of their collections and they've been picked up through family they've been picked up through by word of mouth as has happened with me um market stalls junk shops and so on so um there's quite a rising community of people working with this material and just in terms of where that can all possibly go is one example project b photos is based in the usa they've published um, a number of books on different themes within um, vernacular photography and um, i've just heard that their entire collection has been bought by a serious art museum in the USA. So um, 
that's what can potentially happen um, around building a collection with uh, eventually. That is um, down on the left hand side. Mrs. Wu Tu is my Instagram name if you want to have a look at some of my mid century South African snapshots on Instagram. So that's a creative community um, who are all working with found photographs and slides from the mid century period. Now, I said I'd come back to damage because I've had quite an interesting time with damage. And here are some slides showing the sort of really terrible mold that you can get on found photographs. And um, there are all kinds of um, molds and, and damage that can develop on slides, especially when stored in poor conditions. I won't go into that in much detail, but I'm going to focus on damage from an aesthetic point of view now. Um, here is a slide of a rodeo that was quite badly affected by mold and some sort of cracking effects. I think instead of putting this aside with a bit of a sepia treatment, the, um, the damage has an aesthetic that talks about the age of it. And it's, it's really beautiful to look at and evocative. And I found that over time, I've um, started to really appreciate um, the look and feel of and the textures of that damage when when that slide is actually scanned. It's probably a good idea to uh, wipe the scanner with something disinfectant between each um, scanning so that I don't spread that mold around. But anyway, um, that's how the slide came out with scanning and it's quite a beautiful aesthetic effect. Here are some more examples. Some are quite extreme and mysterious like this one. Um, and the, um, the mold and the, um, the, the effects of the, um, whatever's growing on the surface of the film, it, it gravitates towards certain areas of the picture because it's um, attaching itself to the inks at a chemical level and um, so that can be quite interesting because the mold will tend to become in a sense a part of the picture like these examples demonstrate so on that tr baobab tree on the right hand side it looks a little bit like leaves um, something attached to the branches but that's actually mold um, or um, which is attached to the ink of the branches and so it has that very interesting effect there. And on the left hand side, the mold looks like some sort of um, mossy um, <laughs> creature that has crept um, out of the, the farmer's field and attached itself to him. Um, and there's quite a fascination with, with texture effects. And I've applied some of these um, to slides that didn't have any um, damage or, or mold on them. And without fail, these slides get a lot of interest. So here's another example of that. All right, now I'm going to jump over the next section, which is photo montage very, very quickly, just to show you that I have made some work that is photo montage using um, found photographs in my collection. Um, and I'm going to whip through these very quickly because um, we are running out of time. All right, so what can all this creativity mean for Highgate School? Now, in the archives world, um, there are some very interesting collaborations between archives designers and artists and um, using the aesthetic of the archives and materials and content in the archives for creative projects. So I do think that there um, is potentially some possibilities for exploring um, the school's photo collection. Um, in the art department. And Julia and I have talked about this a little bit. 
um, it's something that I think the school could possibly explore if um, we can find um, time to do that around the curriculum. Um, it's it's potentially quite an exciting area. All right, now just briefly, snapshots as evidence. So we've looked at some fun things, we've looked at some creative things, but now let's just pause and think about snapshots as evidence around some more serious subjects um, because they are a valuable and authentic record of the past. And the four examples I will um, show you briefly are images of Syria and Damascus, which has changed radically since the early 1960s. And we'll go to that straight away. These are um, travel photos of Damascus. And so, um, in the early 1960s, it was a popular travel destination. Um, this world is gone. This world has been destroyed by war and strife. And this is a very valuable record captured by ordinary travelers of what that world was like in the early 1960s. Um, here are a few slides of Bukama Bridge in the Congo um, that were taken in 1963, um, a war-torn area as well, um, a lot of strife, the bridge had been blown up, and the photos that I have in my collection were taken by um, Zimbabwean engineers who went there to rebuild the bridge. And these dignitaries um, who were there to open the bridge, this is a moment in time um, during a highly volatile period in the Congo. Um, this has been captured by a snapshot photographer. I really need to find the archive, right archive to donate it to, but um, it's a, a very compelling little collection um, from the Congo. Um, David mentioned earlier that I now work at the Wiener Holocaust Library. This is an exhibition that's on there at the moment, Jewish family photographs before 1939, um, capturing a world which was already um, under extreme stress within um, Nazi era Germany um, and soon to be um, completely destroyed in the Second World War. So I work every day at the Wiener Library with um, photographs and papers um, amongst their family papers. And um, there's an exhibition on the moment, if you'd like to go and see it, of Jewish family photographs. Um, slightly prior to um, the era of the snapshot, so they're slightly more formal black and white photographs, but um, they certainly um, would be counted in with snapshot photographs of the last century. And then coming back again to Highgate School buildings, Julia said to me that um, these are great because they show what these buildings were like inside. And without them, we just wouldn't have that view anymore. I'm just going to hop past this next thing. <laughs> these are um, school photographs of mine. Um, that's a photograph that I took with my friends, but I won't dwell on this for very long. I just wanted to share something that I took while I was at school in the 1980s in South Africa. So if you'd like to donate any of your snapshots to Highgate School, um, the archive would very gladly receive them. Its collection policy is to take snapshots by pupils, parents, teachers, and the community, anything about the school. And if you want to donate your slides, just get in touch with the archivist and records manager, and there's some contact details for you. And if you happen to be a South African who has some slides that you would like to donate to me, you would also be able to do that via Highgate School, and I would very happily have them. So I did want to talk about storing and taking care of your own slide collection, but um, I don't think we have time. So I'm just going to leave the slide here so that you can come back to the recording on YouTube and have a look at some of these points here. And um, of course, if there are any questions afterwards that deal with this, then I'll happily answer them as part of question time. But um, this just briefly is a slide dealing with my advice for people who have their own slide collections um, to to deal with. And here are some more things that you might want to explore, things I've mentioned in my talk. 
Um, and you can also come back to the slide later if this is a subject that you'd like to explore some more. Um, I wanted to talk about snapshot photography today. We've also run out of time, but um, I think it's pretty ob obvious how we're still taking snapshot photographs, but it's very different to how it was um, in the 1960s, 70s and 80s with completely different technology and behaviors and culture around taking photographs. So that's the end of the talk. Um, this uh, image is actually from um, a slide that somebody used to end their slideshow that they would have given in their lounge back in the 1960s. Mm -hmm.